Good afternoon and welcome for the fourth session of This is Film, Film Heritage in Practice. Uh, my name is Giovanna Fossati. I'm the chief curator of I Film Museum and a professor at the University of Amsterdam. This is Film is a collaboration that started in 2015 uh, between the university, uh, the Amsterdam School for Cultural Analysis and I Film Museum. Uh, the sessions are carried out in close collaboration with uh, This Is Film students who help uh, introduce, introducing our guests and uh, asking them questions. Uh, this year's sessions will be uh, made available online with a few weeks delay and uh, um, a selection of the films screened uh, during the sessions uh, will be available on the iFilm player. And that's the case for the film we are screening today. So this year we focus on the overarching theme, global audiovisual archiving. We chose this topic as we feel that working together towards a truly uh, um, global approach to audiovisual heritage is one of the most urgent challenges uh, for our field today. As mentioned in uh, previ uh, previous sessions, one of the reasons why we feel this urgency is that audiovisual archives, especially in Europe and North America, are eagerly digitizing their own national heritage while their counterparts in low and middle uh, income um, countries in Asia, uh, Latin America, and Africa are just at the beginning of the digitization process. And this is leading to an alarming misrepresentation of our global film heritage, especially in the digital space. Another aspect that we think needs uh, changing is that of the exchange of knowledge and practices. In the last two decades, a research on the cultural, political, economic, and practical consequences of the digitization of audiovisual archives in uh, Europe and North America has led to theory forming uh, focused mainly on developments in these regions based on uh, film and media frameworks that originate from European and North Ameri American discourses. This is obviously a very limited scope and in times of global communication, researcher and archivist can do much better. I have to admit uh, that this has also been the case for my own research. While studying the transition from analog to digital in film archives and uh, underlying theoretical frameworks, I accepted the exclusion of researching theories and practices outside um, Europe and North America as a necessary choice of scope. Recently, I've grown uh, more and more frustrated by this uh, limited scope. In the past few years, we have been confronted with a growing online accessibility to audiovisual material and resources about this heritage. But when we look closely, we see how culturally and aesthetically limited this selection is. It is from this frustration and sense of urgency that we decided to reach out to colleagues across geographical and cultural borders. We are doing this during this year's series of This is Film, um, film Heritage in Practice, and we will continue doing it during the conference, the 7th I International Conference, which will take place here at the end of May, and will focus on the same theme, Global Audiovisual Archiving. The conference has been organized in close collaboration with an uh, advisory board that includes experts uh, active uh, in various countries uh, in Asia, Latin America and Africa, including all the guest speakers uh, who have been invited to this uh, uh, um, year's uh, This is Film. We will gather online and in person more than 50 speakers from very diverse realities from within and outside 
of formalized institutions worldwide, and we hope to facilitate the creation of a network for the long-term exchange of knowledge and learning that is so much needed. Today, uh, we will focus on film heritage in Southeast Asia with our guest Karen Chan, um, director of the Asian Film Archive. But now, first, I would like to introduce Ang Chao Luo, Sanne Hesseling, Tim van de Peppel, and Tikin Tan, who are the uh, This Is Film students in charge of today's session. And on behalf of the group, Tim will introduce our guest. Thank you. And good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Karen Chan uh, is the executive director of the Asian Film Archive uh, and the president of the Southeast Asia Pacific Audiovisual uh, Archive Association, or the CPAVA, uh, which was established in 1996. CPAVA is an organization that is concerned with the development of audiovisual archiving in the countries of Southeast Asia, Australia, Australasia, and the Pacific Islands. Besides promoting audiovisual archiving in this region of the world, CPAVA also aims to make the audiovisual uh, heritage that the regional archives exist of uh, more accessible to the, to the public. Um, the organization of an annual conference, the access to an online database, and the organization of training seminars and activities are only a few examples of the way CPAVA brings awareness to the profession of audiovisual archiving and the audio, audiovisual heritage that is present in the Southeast Asia and the Pacific. The Asian Film Archive was founded in 2005 with an overarching aim to create a place that could serve as a hub for Asian cinema. And it started as a small independent grassroots operation and, and in 2014 became a subsidiary of the Singaporean National Library Board. Under Karen Chan's leadership, Singapore's first film collection was successfully inscribed into the UNESCO Memory of the World Asia Pacific Register. She teaches film preservation, film literacy, and Singapore cinema history to students, educators, and the public. She contributes to, to archiving and library related publications and has jointly written a chapter for the book Singapore Cinema on independent digital filmmaking in Singapore. Her past experiences include teaching English and history, working with the National Arts Council, National Archives of Singapore, and the National History Museum in New York City. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Karen Chan. Thank you so much for the introduction and a very good afternoon to everyone. Um, my name is Karen and um, I'm calling you, or I'm uh, calling in to you uh, from here in Singapore in um, the evening. Um, I would like to thank Giovanna for this invitation and for this opportunity um, and to the Eye Museum as well as the University of Amsterdam for this opportunity to actually uh, talk a little bit about the work that we do here in Singapore for the Asian Film Archive, but also um, on behalf of Supava. Um, I would like in this a short presentation of mine to actually focus on the restoration of the film that you will be seeing shortly after this talk um, and to give you a little bit of context as to where and how the film restoration came about and uh, some of the practices that the Asian Film Archive um, embarked upon in restoring the film. But more importantly, I would like to utilize the film as a platform to discuss some of the archiving um, challenges and principles of archiving that um, have been, um, I suppose, adopted by the archive, um, but also to talk a little bit about the situation of film archiving uh, in Southeast Asia. So maybe without um, further ado, I'll, I'll share my slides and we can move on from there. This is a, a, a screen grab um, taken from the scene of the film. And you can, call, and can, you can see here that the film is called, they call her Cleopatra Wong. And uh, this uh, lead actress in the film, the, uh, the titular um, actress uh, character, um, is sort of uh, this well characterized as this 
you know, superwoman uh, Kung Fu uh, fighting um, with a great deal of ability uh, to um, subdue um, her enemies um, within this uh, rather exotic land that they're presenting. Um, so I would like to give a little bit of background to the film. Um, this was a film that was made in 1978 and it was transnational um, already in that era. Uh, it was filmed um, and involved three uh, cities, um, Hong Kong, uh, of course, the Singapore and um, the Philippines, because the director, Bobby Suarez, or the late Bobby Suarez, uh, was Filipino. And this particular production uh, starred a Singaporean um, actress in her debut film. She was uh, just auditioned, and uh, her name is Marie Lee, and um, she, there she is in this um, you know, poster that uh, the AFA uh, sort of featured um, many years ago, actually, way before we became a subsidiary of the National Library. And at that time, we were still unable to find any um, uh, surviving um, prints or negatives or any kind of a screening copy of the film. Um, so really at that point in time, we only knew that the original film elements had deteriorated to a point that they were thrown out by the owners. And at this point, we um, were just getting to know the actress, uh, Marie, and had developed a relationship with her because she was um, very eager to look for the film as well. And there she introduced um, the, the archive to Bobby, um, based in the Philippines. But unfortunately, we never got to meet him, even though we had um, you know, spoken to him uh, or written to him, rather. And he had um, passed on in 2010. Thereafter, we developed, um, we continued the conversation with his son, Richard, Richard Suarez, who took on his father's business. Now, I give you this little history because it really does speak a lot about the kinds of relationships that an archive has to build with its stakeholders in order to be able to you know, um, slowly built its collection. And this really does not come overnight. You have, we have to um, be patient and quite tenacious in um, developing that sort of, um, not just the relationship, but the level of trust uh, that we will and can take care of any material that should come along the way um, and that we would um, respect right, the, the, the work of um, the filmmaker. Um, and as we couldn't find any original um, elements, film elements at that point, uh, we were looking through Marie's collection of um, all the different kinds of posters that she had acquired um, of the film. And it was then that we realized that the film had you know, through the posters shown or illustrated that it had really traveled. And obviously it had traveled uh, a combination to both Europe and to the Middle East. Um, and this is really interesting because um, at that time, um, having a English speaking uh, film uh, was not all that common in Asia, in Southeast Asia. And Bobby Suarez was ahead of his time trying to actually make a series of uh, English speaking films or English language films uh, that would then, you know, he would uh, trans sort of dub um, and then let it travel to different parts of the world. And um, by this time in 2017, we decided that we needed to sort of do a more open call and embark on this search for the film elements. And this is the first step uh, to reaching through um, the Sipava network um, to all the archives who were members in Southeast Asia. And we were a little bit, um, I guess, a, a combination of, of being quite sad um, at at the same time, um, really um, feeling the sense of urgency because 
no archive in Southeast Asia um, had any inkling of this film or where it uh, might have um, you know, been kept. So we, we didn't find anything for several years. But because of discovering this collection of posters and knowing that it had traveled to Europe, we decided to make a call through the uh, FIEF network, which is the uh, International Federation of, uh, or rather Federation of International Archives, um, where there are over, you know, 120 members within the, the, the um, Federation to look at, you know, just ask, um, uh, archives if they might actually have something within their collection. Um, and it was through this call that we found um, a, a 35 mm German dubbed release print uh, from the um, film archive in Austria, uh, then and a 16 mm uh, release print with burned in Danish subtitles from the Danish film archive. There were also prints in Switzerland and Italy, but um, they were not in um, as good condition as um, these two prints uh, found in Austria and in um, uh, Denmark. So at this point, we realized that this is what we needed to do, you know, it, being able to collaborate and to tap on these international networks is where we would have the most um, success in actually saving uh, films that we once thought were lost, was already lost. And it gave us a lot of hope. Um, and you can imagine the excitement of my colleagues when we found out that these uh, prints actually existed. Now, this is uh, actually a, um, a, almost like a condition report that the Austrian um, Film Archive um, did on our behalf. And again, this really shows um, how archives who work together to be able to provide the kind of information uh, that enable us to be able to, you know, save some of our films from across uh, continents, um, really. And um, those of you who can uh, read German, I shall not um, attempt the pronunciation, um, would know that it translates into Cleopatra Wong, the insurmountable. Um, so I hope that gives you uh, a little bit of um, uh, anticipation in watching the film later. Um, so this particular condition report just shows how, de how much detail um, would go into it. And it gave us a great deal of information to work with um, and to be able to you know, figure out what to do. And um, the Austrian archive actually, uh, we, we managed to take this print um, to digitize it and work with the digital copy um, for the restoration. Uh, this is a screenshot of the original uh, Danish uh, title, uh, the, uh, the print, um, and the cover, one of the um, screenshots, and you can see that uh, obviously the print has uh, deteriorated to some extent and the color um, was uh, really quite faded already. And because the Danish subtitles were burned in, uh, this was something that we really had to work um, with uh, the, uh, the, the restoration lab to figure out what to do, right? Um, this is actually an example of how the lab, um, after they had examined the print, uh, or rather the, uh, the film elements, um, reverted to us you know, to let us know what were some of their recommendations, for instance. And it allowed us a chance to figure out uh, how we could uh, move forward with the restoration. Um, and uh, from this, you will later on see that um, the, the, the restoration, uh, we had to utilize the 35 mm print as the primary image. Um, as the image source, uh, primary image source. And then we combined it with the original English soundtrack from the 16 mm print. And then portions of the opening sequence uh, and the 
entire end credits had to be restored using the 16mm print because the 35mm print uh, contained German opening titles and the end credits were missing. So you can imagine the, the complexity of this uh, piece of uh, the, uh, on the film itself. Um, and at this point in time, we knew that uh, there were some things that we needed to remove because the English and Danish subtitles on the 16mm print was overlapping each other. Um, so there was some material that we had to digitally remove. And later on, we created a new English title uh, using the original scans as a reference. Now, this really shows that there is some work that the archive has to take some liberty at trying to work with whatever elements we can find. It may not fall into or within the principles of restoration per se, um, as some people might say, you know, you should you shouldn't touch the original, you shouldn't you know, change things, but there was no other way to work with. And if we didn't do it this way uh, and make those changes as, as necessary, um, we would not be able to present the film. Um, so there were some things that we had and had to deliberate over and find the best way forward in order to ensure that the restoration could actually uh, be made possible. All right, so as a result of all that work, we finally um, did restore the film and it was uh, finally screened in 2021. Now, all of this happened between uh, 2017 when we started embarking for the search of the film and then the digitization that happened in 2018, um, followed by the restoration. And when we were ready to actually uh, present it in 2020, uh, COVID struck. And we thought that it was just not uh, the right time when we started to have a limited reopening that so few people would be able to see the film. So we really waited until um, it had uh, pretty much you know, gone back to some semblance of normalcy in Singapore in November, uh, rather October uh, 2021 that we started to screen um, the film. And this really is, um, a real lesson for us to be patient, to wait for the right time to uh, present something like this uh, for a screening, um, you know, so that as many people can um, um, have a chance to see it. Okay, I'm just going to show you a little clip. Um, it's a trailer of the film, um, and this gives you a clue as to what the film might be, but but it really also has some points which I'd like to share with you um, after you've seen it. And it's a short clip of under a minute. Mm. <laughs> There's only one person in the world who phoned me at four in the morning. It's something closer to home. I can't discuss it over the phone. Every time Tim calls me up at some unearthly hour of the night, I always end up with a big mission. Your death will be painless. And instant. Either way, I die. Is that it? There is only one person in the world who knows where to phone me at this time of night. And that's Cleopatra Wong. This uh, image that you're seeing here, the slide, is uh, Marie Lee there. Uh, the actress uh, introducing the film and sharing with the audience uh, what it was like um, being, you know, seeing her, the film again on the big screen and being in uh, kind of, you know, being with the audience. And um, I think she spoke about how um, it really brought back memories for her. But more importantly, I think she felt that um, it was 
time for the, uh, a new audience to be able to see the film and to see it with new eyes. Um, I hope you noted that the, the accent of the um, actors, that was the dubbed um, English that I was speaking about, how Bobby Suarez uh, really created films like these. Um, and this was the American kind of, um, I suppose, uh, accented English that a lot of uh, audiences in Southeast Asia would have been accustomed to given the um, a proliferation of Hollywood films uh, at that time. And of course, you can see that this Kung Fu kind of um, action flake was really you know, coming off the hills of um, uh, the, the craze in, um, with, uh, you know, you know, the Bruce Lee, as well as the James Bond kind of uh, franchise, right? So these were the kinds of things that were influencing um, cinema in Southeast Asia. And um, it's really interesting that the audience that came um, to see the film were a range of, um, a wide range of demographic from people, you know, uh, who are much older um, and reminiscing about the scenes that they were seeing in the film that was so familiar to them, but also uh, young Singaporeans and, and other uh, nationalities who um, really were seeing a whole new landscape that they, they're not familiar with because so much has changed um, in, in the countries uh, that this film was made in. And certainly even Marie was saying, you know, sometimes she doesn't even recognize our own city because you know, so much um, change so much change happened um, has happened and our landscape and cityscape looks so different uh, from the film and from um, you know what it is as it is and and I guess this really does is a testament to uh, film being the documentary record of what a country is like and how important it is as a uh, memory to its um, uh, to any country that that is that it was made in. Right. Um, okay, and of course, um, right after this film was made and uh, rather the screening was uh, uh, presented, uh, there was a lot of media interest. And what was good about it was that it elevated um, some uh, interest, not just in the film, but in the transnational and local films that people were not seeing and questions were asked about, you know, where are these films? Where can we find them? And who may have these films? And of course that highlights the archives work and brings a lot of um, much needed um, uh, awareness of how urgent, uh, you know, archiving film, our film heritage is. So this is a, um, a short of uh, a little showcase that we did using the paraphernalia on a memorabilia that came from Marie's, uh, Marie Lee's uh, collection. Um, and it included things like the uh, original screenplay, um, the posters, um, original lobby cards, uh, specially designed um, uh, material, uh, material that we actually created as a result of this film. And that was that's something that I would like to highlight, aside from the opportunity that we could actually use this event to um, raise awareness of the importance of the related material to the film. And sometimes how, uh, like I explained earlier, that it was through the related material of the posters that we um, figured out that the film had actually traveled. Um, and that's really important information that, you know, if you didn't have a film, the actual film um, to work with, then the related material gives you all kinds of information that uh, you may not have been aware of, right? Um, as a result of this uh, event, we actually collaborated with a young a sort of a young design collective and the uh, young designers watched the film and um, used that inspiration to design a series of new merchandise that actually brought about, I suppose, um, a new crowd, um, maybe attracting a younger crowd to the theater and to um, a greater awareness of the work of the AFA and to also watch the films that we were putting out. So. 
really this is just an opportunity for the archive to, um, I suppose, take, it, take um, what we have and work with different partners to be able to put forth uh, things that would enable our work to be um, made more um, accessible, I suppose, uh, to different crowds and to different uh, demographic of um, audiences and, and a new generation of um, um, film wa watchers in that sense, right? Okay, so, um, this brings the, me to the end of this segment of the presentation and uh, please, please feel free to check out our website and follow us on social media um, to see what are some of the things that the archive is doing. And because you are, you know, um, outside of where we are in, within a different um, time zone and everything, I uh, hope you would check out our YouTube channel um, and allow, you know, uh, sort of the opportunity to see um, some of the things that we uh, put out from our collection and um, just have a chance to look at some of the Asian uh, films that uh, you may not have had a chance to um, uh, watch. Thank you very much, Karen, for this uh, fascinating presentation using the restoration of uh, Cleopatra Wong as a starting point to illustrate uh, your activities and the challenges. Uh, I think uh, the, the global challenges we all know yeah. when we <laughs> look for a, uh, a film that we we that it's considered lost, but there is always hope. So this is yes. uh, this is the. Uh, great part of the story. Um, what I'd like to ask you um, uh, uh, in connection to this uh, uh, transnational production, the film and transnational restoration effort, well, really global since you found copies in, uh, in Austria and Denmark, um, uh, the, the Asian Film Archive is uh, really unique in being a transnational archive. I don't really know any other archive with a clear transnational mission. And in that sense, I, I find it really fascinating, interesting and important. So what, what I'd like to maybe uh, uh, um, to ask you to tell us a little bit more about the, the uh, yeah, transnational nature of the archive and also uh, the, the role it has uh, uh, within Asia. Uh, and, mm. and um, as a probably complementary archive, collaborative archive with other national archives in, in, in various uh, Asian countries. Yes, thank you. Um, and, and you're really right uh, that we are quite unique in our setup and um, unique in our mission. Um, and I have to admit that when we first embarked on this, it was a very terrifying <laughs> um, uh, sort of project. We had no clue um, how we would survive past, you know, um, the first year or the second year for that matter. And um, it was actually the community um, or the filmmaking community um, within Asia that gave us that sort of impetus to forge ahead. Um, because in that first year when we made a call to Southeast Asian films, uh, filmmakers alone, uh, we received um, almost 400 um, film titles uh, that they wanted the AFA to um, uh, preserve on their behalf. And that helped us or cemented the notion that there was indeed a need um, that, we, that we were filling a gap uh, in the region. Um, there were already film archives in Southeast Asia. Uh, certainly uh, Indonesia had the Cinematheque and um, uh, Vietnam had the Vietnam Film Institute and uh, Thailand had a film archive that was already, you know, they were already doing their work within um, their countries, but focusing on um, work coming out of their own country, right? So it was, it was focused on individual countries. Um, but a lot of film was also not archived because they were made independently 
or sometimes they would leave the country and, and be co-produced um, co um, outside of the country, and they found that they couldn't actually make it back in for whatever reason that might be. And that the, the reasons are uh, just you know, a, a multitude of it. Um, and so I think the AFA came at a point when they recognized or filmmakers recognized that where they were unable to get their own archive to uh, preserve their work, the AFA could be the alternative. Um, we have worked with filmmakers whereby when we first started out, they had no archive to begin with, all their archive didn't take in the works. But over time, when they, their own archive in the country was able to take, we were more than happy to work with that, you know, the, that country's archive, because the whole idea is not to be territorial about the titles, about the film or the collection. So we, what we wanted to do was just to be able to allow the film to go back, but keep a copy with us. So there was a, a backup. Right, And this has worked out very well in the last 18 years. That's how our collection has grown. And that's how we have worked and collaborated with all the archives in our region, as well as in East Asia, where we've started to you know, work uh, within. And a lot of it actually um, hugs back to our connections with Sipava. And because of this network uh, of different archives coming together, I think there is a greater sense of understanding that we're not trying to um, usurp any kind of collective uh, collection or any um, country's works. Um, it really is an understanding that we're, we're there to help and where our help is not exactly needed we won't step into that realm, right? So there's a, there's a great deal of mutual respect, I think. And also the fact that the filmmakers know that uh, we're there if they needed us, um, but also that we're not just there as a storage place, um, you know? So it really is um, trying to educate as well as to make filmmakers aware of what an archive really is, um, that we're not there just to store your material. And it really has to be made available for research, for screenings, and to be facilitated across the world um, for more people to be able to appreciate their work. And I think I'm hoping that after 18 years, there's some gradual increase in that sort of awareness. That's great. Thank you. I think Asana has a related question. Yes, I was wondering, um, with the Asian Film Archive being based on transnational practice, um, what's the process of looking for more secure and long-term funding? I've got no real answer. <laughs> it's really fundraising. It's um, one of the most difficult tasks any archive um, is has to has to sort of face head on, and no archivist will tell you that they enjoy this work at all. Um, when we first started out, I spent um, I would say ninety nine or maybe ninety five percent of my time doing nothing but fundraising. Um, it was just some things that I think people understood that film was accessible and necessary or maybe even highly important to um, our heritage, but they didn't understand that preservation requires this amount of money and this amount of sustained funding um, for the long haul, right? So a lot of people always said, oh, if I gave you, say, you know, um, hundred dollars what would my hundred dollars achieve and I think that's trying to under to um, kind of uh, raise that that sort of understanding that that hundred dollars is not something that um, goes directly into what we are able to tangibly show you but the archive is meant to last beyond beyond the lifetime of you know the, the current um, a slate of, um, of uh, management, right? We hope that what we're working towards will go beyond us. So I, 
I always tell people that they need to support us. If they feel that our work is important, then they need to support our programs. They need to support, um, I suppose, come forth um, if they can with um, whatever that they can, whether it be money or a financial sort of support, or it could be their time and expertise. It could be them trying to spread that word um, amongst their um, circle of uh, community, right? Um, and it's also keeping an eye out for whatever material that they think the archive can do. So to circle back to your question about long-term funding, I'm not sure, I don't have the answer, um, but what I am working towards is to uh, uh, create that urgency and awareness in our stakeholders and in our current funders that they can't just leave us in the lurch by just giving us a startup amount. It's something that needs a continuous support. And especially in the realm of digital, I mean, I think all of you uh, as digital natives will understand that digital archiving and digital preservation is so much more expensive than analog. And once we embark on that, I think it, it is a, a, a cost that is um, going to be um, exponentially higher every year. And so this is explaining a constant explanation to our, our funders and our stakeholders on the kind of work um, and the amount of uh, support that is needed in order that the archive survives beyond a generation. Um, and I'm hoping that that message will somehow sink in uh, and hopefully, you know, we will continue to get that sort of um, um, support across the board. Thank you so much. There's a question from Tikin. Hello, Karen. I really love Hi. your speech. And as an international student with Asian background, uh, I also noticed that the archiving of Asian films is, uh, is still at a beginning stage. Yeah. So what do you think are, or could you please introduce several the current uh, opportunities and the challenges facing the uh, archiving of Asian films? Yeah. I suppose I wouldn't say it is exactly at the beginning because there are film archives, uh, say for instance, the China Film Archive that was established in the 1950s or say the um, National Film Archive of India that was established in 1964. Um, so there are some film archives in the world, uh, in, in Asia that have uh, some history. Um, but generally speaking, um, we're, Asia is a little bit late to the game for, for film preservation. Um, and we have lost a lot of material, um, unfortunately, partly due to neglect in a way that our climate um, is so unforgiving. You know, it's hot and humid and the humidity is just beyond, you know, crazy. Um, so I guess it has not been kind to our films. Um, but to top it all off, I think our funders, our governments um, are all only realizing maybe a little late um, that we've lost a lot of a lot of our uh, cinematic heritage. Um, and this is coming on the heels of also the fact that um, the archives in the world um, are now talking a lot more and collaborating more. Um, and the international networks that we have, um, that have you know, sort of flourished uh, in, in especially the last uh, 20 years, I suppose, um, really has brought a great deal of attention to um, both film and audiovisual archiving or archiving in general. And it's created a greater sense of the fact in Asia that this is an industry that people can uh, enter and has a, a future and a, and a, and a career too. Um, for the longest time, even when I first entered uh, this, this industry, you know, more than 20 years ago, um, nobody had heard about archiving. What in the world is that, right? And um, my parents weren't all that supportive, thinking that, you know, what are you doing? You know, you, you should be going into, I don't know, government ministry or something. And nobody knew what archiving involved. 
But now it's so much more, there's so much more support. There's a lot more um, educational sort of uh, facilities and, and, and that sort of collaborative uh, um, opportunities to open up doors for us to learn from each other um, really has given us opportunities in Asia. But challenges remain. I mean, it will remain. Um, but I think the greatest one is to find the materials that um, we have left for a long time to not, not save, you know. Um, so I think it's really embarking on that search and, and archives around in Asia need to work a lot closer to each other and work with each other. There's only so much we can do alone, um, but working collectively, there's a lot more strength and a lot more eyes and ears to the ground. And we certainly can find a lot more material and pull resources together to work uh, towards saving this, you know, valuable gems, I really, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. A question from Hang Xiao. Uh, hello, Karen. Thank you for your insightful uh, presentation. Uh, speak of challenge, I believe like uh, COVID-19 must be a huge challenge, not just for our daily life, but also for archive um, presentation and uh, preservation. Uh, so I'm curious about the presentation of other films that you restored beside mm -hmm. this film, they call her Cleopatra Wong. Um, since you've managed to organize some screenings at uh, Oldham Theater, but mm -hmm. under the COVID-19 circumstance, uh, how did you adapt your strategies from the sphere of presentation? Yeah, um, it, it, yes, it has been a challenge. Um, and like many archives and many festivals in the world, we've all gone online. Um, but we limited our online presentations to non-restored works. Um, and there was a reason for that. Um, I think we felt that we needed to do some, the film some justice uh, to have it presented on, this, on a large screen. And I mentioned earlier that uh, in my presentation that we waited uh, you know, a good number of years for us to even present um, Copetra. Um, and I think there is value to knowing what we can, uh, uh, or what, how the programming should be, right? The online sort of um, platform is wonderful. I mean, I, I um, have come to appreciate it a lot. And I think that has changed the way we consume film, but also define uh, the perimeters of what we um, if what we call film or what we regard as film, right? Um, and I think that has opened up a huge number of doors for creatives, um, film creatives as well as uh, art in general um, and, and creative um, and the creative industry um, across the board. Um, but I think at the core of it as an, a film archive, um, we kind of do hold some element of wanting to go back to the big screen um, and to draw our audiences back to the screen, to the theater where we can. Um, and while it may seem a bit of a purist uh, sort of uh, move, um, it is also a way for us to show that sort of difference of what the a film archive can present versus what Netflix or what Amazon can show you on your small screen. Um, so what we've tried to do when COVID, uh, when we had to close our, our theater, was that uh, we went online, uh, we showcased uh, things that we could and from our collection, as well as from other films that um, you know, we could actually program as a, co a online collection. Um, but at the same time, we deviated from screenings. Um, we realized that if we couldn't engage people in this manner, then we had to find another way to engage with our, our audience. And one way was that, um, I'll give you two examples. One was um, we commissioned um, 10 of sort of video essays uh, from around Asia uh, to look at the world then through you know, of, of COVID, right? Um, that, that, that sort of new world um, through the lens of Asian cinema. And what impact did it have on Asian cinema? And I, I 
can't tell you how um, amazing the works were. Um, it, it, you know, there was some sense of release, I suppose, for the filmmakers to be able to do something, um, but to also showcase it within a rather um, encapsulated uh, piece, right? Um, and so that that was one way that we um, that those ten video essays then, after they were commissioned, um, we travelled it uh, as a package to different film festivals around the world online. And those that could show it in person did, and others that couldn't just continue to show it online. But it allowed for us to, prov to provide a platform for filmmakers, but also a platform for people to be able to see that there was a continued interaction uh, between the archive and um, our main stakeholders, which were filmmakers, right? Um, the second example is actually uh, we created something called the Asian Cinema Digest. And it was a monthly sort of digest that we collated everything that went online or that could go online in some you know, good form um, about Asian cinema. And we have continued this um, digest up to today. Um, it gets a lot of traction because I think people like the fact that they could go to a one-stop shop and find everything online that is about online Asian cinema that they could see, watch, hear, you know, um, read, um, attend, or like uh, even apply for things. You know, so it it just gave a great deal of um, information and um, that engaged. Our, our audience uh, in a different way. And I so I guess a very long way to say how we engage with people is to really think outside of the box, right? Screenings are just one way um, and finding that opportunity to, to um, uh, interact with people in different forms is really essential for an archive to remain sustainable but also to be relevant in sort of the new kind of environment that we're in. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. I think we have time for one last question. Let's see if uh, there's a question emerging from the audience. Mm, I don't see one. So um, I think Tim has a question. Since this is a transnational film archive and uh, your mission is to preserve films made by independent Asian filmmakers, to what extent is it difficult to select which films you would like to preserve and which ones you don't? <laughs> it's a very difficult task. Um, it's a really a difficult task in a in a national archive, you know, much less a transnational one. Um, and um, I would say that it. Uh, involves a great deal of research. Um, our team is a small one. Uh, we only have, uh, we're made up of three within the collections uh, team. Um, so they do a lot of ground research and um, sort of trying to figure out if a, a particular film, for instance, what's its impact on that society, for instance, or on that um, country and whether it's already archived by any other institution in the world. Right. We try not to duplicate the work, um, you know, given limited resources and all that. But more importantly, we want to make sure that um, if we archive it, uh, it is uh, as best as we can. So we take in whatever that um, the filmmaker might have in its highest, in their best and highest resolution, you know, or, or whatever in whatever format it may come in. Um, and then we work with them to figure out if they've given it to any other archive um, and to kind of delve into their memory, right? And filmmakers aren't really the best um, in recording or cataloging, um, or, you know, their, their material and information. And so this is where we work with them to kind of, um, I guess, emphasize how important it is for them to think about archiving right from the beginning of their, their project or their work, rather than many years down the road when they've forgotten uh, where things are, who they've given it to, um, who may actually be holding the rights to it if it's not to them. So 
there's a lot of things to kind of um, decipher when we try to figure out if the film is something that we should take in. Um, but essentially, we have a um, selection criteria on, and it's actually shared on our website. Um, and get, that gets reviewed on a yearly basis to see if, you know, that we're, we're keeping relevant. But um, I have to admit that this digital era has made it way difficult, um, you know, for uh, selection. And it has also made it much more challenging because we know that the films are being archived in different or on different platforms, perhaps by the filmmaker, um, deposited, sometimes not even with their knowledge. Um, and um, they don't even know where and who holds the rights to some of these um, you know, titles. Um, and so it has become um, particularly um, tricky, I suppose, um, you know, trying to figure out uh, what titles, you know, become top of the priority list versus something that we know, for instance, in the past, it was very clear, oh, if, if, if you didn't have like, um, um, say, the negatives or the prints or the, you know, something physical, it, it, we, we were more inclined to just, okay, we'll just take a, a screener and we'll help look for the analog, the, the, the actual original materials. But these days, you know, what do you do when you just, you're handed a, a, a drive with thousands of materials in it and you've got to figure out what within that do you archive, right? So um, it's one of those questions that similar to the funding question, right? That it's a necessary job, but it also has become so difficult to answer what that priority is. And sometimes we know it when we see it, um, the, the answers are there um, and, and we, you know instantly if the film is, you know, perhaps banned. Um, there's no other copy of it. Um, the filmmaker, you know, um, maybe knows that it will never get back to his, his or her country. That particular film is just already, you know, locked out. Um, those kinds of things may, you know, just cause it to rise up in the priority um, list and, and, and we work through it. Um, so a lot of it is actually um, trying to research and then um, talk to people and, and kind of dig out that information. And we make those decisions uh, on the ground as, as it comes, um, but you live with it as well, right? You live with the decisions that you make today uh, for that sort of, preserved work that you know is going to last or hopefully will last uh, for an, uh, another a future. Right? So I don't know if I've answered it, but that's the best I can in, in this few minutes. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, Karen, I think we are wrapping up and moving on to Cleopatra Wong. So thank you very much for being with us today. And, Thank uh, you for having me. And thank you for also participating to the, on the advisory board of the conference. Uh, and um, thank you for all your time. So yeah. um, uh, now uh, uh, I'd like to move on to the screening. But first, uh, uh, bear with us. We uh, need a few minutes uh, to move all those computers and cables out of the theater. So it will take a few minutes before we start the screening. Um, uh, I hope to see you all back uh, in two weeks on May 4 uh, uh, to talk about the African Film Heritage Project with Abubakar Sanogo. And uh, thank you all. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, everybody. And enjoy the screening. Thank you.